Today, Derivatives for Beginners, Part 1. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. A couple of days ago, I made a long post with the CEC relating to derivatives and the problem with regard to the size of the risks in that particular market. And I think the post, despite being nearly an hour long, was well received. But I had a whole bunch of people afterwards saying, wow, 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 Martin, hang on. You lost me right at the beginning because we don't understand how derivatives work. So today I want to try and, in basic terms, go through the derivatives question again, but this time from a point of view of trying to understand what they are, how they work and how they came into existence. So for those of you who follow the capital markets and understand, this post may not be for you. But if you're someone who's trying to get their head around what a derivative is, how it works, and why it's a significant risk, then perhaps this post will help. And to do this, I'm going to introduce you to Farmer Bill. Now, Farmer Bill is a wheat grower. And Farmer Bill grows wheat every year, he plants at the beginning of the year and harvests later in the year, assuming that there's enough rain to make the crop come full circle. Because he grows wheat and because he is looking normally at the spot price of wheat, it's not clear to him what the final price will be. Because of that, he won't know whether he's able to turn a profit in the year. Therefore, Farmer Bill faces a perpetual risk. The question is, of course, is there a way to protect or hedge against the risk of an unknowable future price? And that's where derivatives comes in. So Farmer Bill and his wheat has the potential to lock in an arrangement to give certainty about the price down the track. Basically, Farmer Bill agrees at the start of the planting year to deliver, I don't know, let's say 100 bushels of wheat at an agreed price on an agreed date in the future. And that agreement means that providing that Bill can turn up with the 100 bushels of wheat, he will get the price that he knows and he can plan accordingly. And that's a futures contract. It's essentially an agreement to deliver something physically down the track, but locks in a price now. And derivatives really are contracts that derive their value from the performance of an underlying asset, event or outcome. In this case, it's to do with the delivery of wheat. And way back in 1848, that's how the Chicago Board of Trade started. It became a trading ground to allow those growing wheat and other commodities and those selling them and trading them to come together to provide certainty for sellers and an opportunity for buyers. Now I need to bring in the banker. And, of course, bankers often see opportunities and, not surprisingly, this whole concept got them quite excited. Because the marketplace developed. And originally you had sellers and buyers trading, but, of course, people realised that if you actually first agreed to buy and then to sell, the two contracts could wipe each other out and it negated the need for physical delivery of the wheat in the first place. Now, if the price moved during the course of the year, then you could actually make a profit between the buy 
and the sell side of the transaction. Or indeed, if prices went the wrong way, you could make a loss. And that counterparty now may be called a speculator because they're not just hedging, but they're actually looking to take on risk in anticipation of earning a return. And here's an example. This is the US wheat futures. The price is quoted every day and traders can buy and sell against this theoretical future delivery. And the prices are publicly quoted and appropriately authorised participants can buy or sell at any time, hoping to make a turn on the difference between the buy and the sell side. Now, here's the thing. The number of contracts can proliferate because most will be closed out well before the settlement is due. And that means that the volume of transactions can grow very firmly. But in addition, you have the potential for profit or loss. And of course, the more contracts are there, the more transactions are done, the more potential value can be created for those bankers or intermediaries who benefit from the trading. And so this becomes a catalyst for speculation. And we've come a long way now from Farmer Bill and his wheat, because essentially the bulk of trading on these exchanges are once or twice removed from those underlying commodities. Now, since the formation of the Chicago Board of Trade back in 1848, and it's one of the world's oldest futures and options exchanges, there are now more than 50 different options and futures contracts, and many thousands of members are trading them, both through Open Outcry, which is the physical exchange, and more and more now through electronic trading. And derivatives always have to have some connection to an underlying element, which is both well-defined and quantifiable. But you can have derivatives on agricultural products such as wheat and rice and soybeans, cotton, butter, milk, livestock like pigs and cattle, currencies, interest rates, individual shares and equity indices, bond indices, economic factors such as the inflation rate or even house prices, natural resources such as crude oil, natural gas, gold, silver and timber, weather-related outcomes such as heating or cooling days, and other products such as electricity or fertilisers. So there's a very wide range of different types of commodities and other underlying instruments. And of course, the interest rates and currencies have become ever more important. Now, let me just come back to Farmer Bill one more time, because Farmer Bill may have another option, literally. What if the farmer doesn't want to lock in the price because the farmer thinks that the price of wheat might be going to increase, but wants to put some sort of minimum on the table so that he knows for sure that he's going to get more than a certain price for that wheat that's going to be delivered later in the year. Well, if you also find a cereal producer thinks that the price of wheat is going to decrease, for example, but wants to make sure that no more than a certain amount will be paid, then potentially there is a derivative called an option. And this is one of the alternative flavours of derivatives, which has become ever more important in recent times. Because an option potentially offers a solution to both parties, and it gives one party, the buyer, the right, but not the obligation to demand an action from the other party, the seller, in the future. And for a small fee, for example, Bill could buy an option contract which allows him to sell an agreed amount of wheat at some time in the future. And the price of the option, in other words, how much he has to pay for it, will be dependent on what's called the strike price, which is 
the price at which the contract is agreed relative to the current spot prices. So an option contract provides essentially greater leverage, but also greater risk, particularly if you're on the wrong side and are forced to complete the contract and there's a widely differing price from what was expected. Now, the options is just one other example of a flavour of derivatives, and there are many more, such as swaps, swaptions, and I could go on listing lots of different ones, which I won't do today. But I think there are three points that are worth making. First, this whole derivatives area has moved away from being directly related to commodities, as Farmer Bill originally was, to become a centre of trading between major financial entities around the world, as we showed in our earlier post. Secondly, there is a difference between the face value of the agreed contracts and the potential risks that may be undertaken by parties because they have the ability to offset buy and sell side transactions. But the degree of risk is not knowable until the events actually happen. And if in fact markets move considerably from where they currently are, then the impact on those trading derivatives are substantial. And thirdly, the amount of disclosure around derivatives generally is pretty low, as we showed, and even in Australia, our major banks are quite widely exposed. Now, I think there's probably room for another post where I will go into more detail around the specific instruments which are in the derivatives bucket. But hopefully that's given you a bit of a flavour of what a derivative is, how it came into existence, and how it works in practice. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you again next time.